So if you look at the active shooter incident management checklist, it details out what contact team one does, how it gets formed, and what its responsibilities are. But what about contact two? What is the job of contact team two? How does it get formed? Where do they go? That's today's topic. Stick around. Welcome to the Active Shooter Incident Management Podcast. My name is Bill Godfrey, your podcast host. I am joined today by two of our law enforcement instructors, Adam Penley and Billy Perry, back in the house. Good to have you guys back. Good Thank to you. Be back. Thank All you. right. So today's topic, we're going to talk about contact team two, how it gets formed, when it gets formed, who, what the tasks are, what their purpose is supposed to do. And I'll kind of lead us off and then you guys can, can jump in here. So what we're looking for, those first three, four officers that get there, we, we're not asking them to wait, you know, for contact team right. one, they, they get there, they go in as they get there and they link up and they become contact one for contact team two. And this can happen sometimes at a rally point out front, or it can happen at staging. If tactical gets there and establishes staging location, we don't want to delay for contact two. We want them to get formed quickly, self-formed and to push forward. And they may be pushing forward before, Tactical is either established or has their feet underneath them. And so what we generally say is we want them to push forward, link up with contact one and make good things happen. But let's give a little more specificity to that. Adam, you want to lead us off? Sure. Um, so I think one of the major important things that we're looking at for contact team two is that there is a contact team two. Um, I think most law enforcement training would have those first arriving officers be fairly disciplined. Even if a sole officer goes in that second, third, fourth is going to link up and become contact team one. I think we've got a pretty solid understanding of that. I worry that all the follow on officers then are coming from multiple different directions. There's no organization there. And now you have a contact team one and six or seven other officers that are all still using their individual call signs. And it adds to confusion, crossfire, blue on blue, and the, and you don't want any of that. So first, recognize the importance of a contact team, too. Um, and have it form up, like you said, either as everyone's arriving to the next entry point, you know, and do the same link-up procedure that you would do to become contact team one. And as contact team two, you're either – trailing right behind what contact team one is doing. And you're there to do a couple of things. One, you can provide additional firepower to, to address the active threat. You can apply a little bit of strategy. We're pushing him this direction. We need you to go around to the, to the other side or this direction or hold the stairwell, or you've pushed through where there's injured people and contact team one continues to move towards the threat and contact team two stays behind to, to begin securing what you can to begin rescue. So there's a lot of things that we can talk about as far as what contact team two's job is going to be. But the main thing is to recognize that we have to stay organized and create a second contact team. All right. I like it. It's a good place to start. So Billy, what I'd like you to address before we get too far into this is I don't want to assume that everybody knows what we mean by link up procedures. So can you kind of walk people through what you want to see happen? What do we want to see happen with those teams in terms of link up procedures uh, so that they don't get into crossfire? Right. Well, I think communication is tied amount. I think being able to communicate, no, where you're like contact two needs to contact or need to, needs to communicate. I'm sorry with contact team one, ask what they need, ask if they do need support, if they can talk, if they can talk, if they can't talk, they just need to go where they were and just be super hyper vigilant and aware of where they're going. They may be going into a really hot zone where none of nobody on contact one can talk. Cause if you're busy and you're working, you're busy and you're working. So, and by that, I mean, in a gunfight. Right. That's not a time to send a text message. Correct. <laughs> correct. And, uh, you know, regardless of the, you know, inconvenience. So, uh, you know, you, you've got stuff to do. So do God's work and, and move forward. But once they link, link up, I want to link up visually. I want to link up safely and then get clear direction of what we need. I'm from the era of let's look for work. And I think, you know, that, that spans from, like Adam said, if we need to put more guns in the fight, get put more guns in the fight. If we need to start direct care, start direct care. If we need to start setting up, you know, calling for rescue task forces, RTS, start RTS, set up a good perimeter. You know, what's our our standard is set up set up security, an immediate action plan, and then start 
first aid, you know, uh, direct care. So I think we need to do that for contacting too. So you said something interesting. I want to drill down a little bit because you mentioned um, uh, the, the visually linking up. Uh, and I don't know that I'd, I'd heard that. Disc- of course, you know, I'm from the fire sure, side, so sure. right, not my area of expertise. Um, but if you're linking up, if you're contact two and you're linking up with contact one and you're able to like visually signal them and you're, Correct. they know you're there and you know, they're there, would you still advocate them to do the blue, blue, blue? Or is it, is that just an announcement you want to do when you're coming around blind corners? What's your thoughts on that? I am a department of redundancy department. <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, two is one, one is none. So I'm going to keep doing it because friendly fire isn't, and I don't want to get shot by anybody, my own people, my friends, my enemies, nobody. And so I'm going to be hyper aware and I'm going to be very thorough in, in that. And I do want to link up visually. I want to tell them this is us coming across the field. This is whatever, mm-hmm. you know, cause under stress, people do crazy things and it's a significant emotional event for everybody. Right. And I think, um, I think it's important to stress that, uh, you know, there there could be the occasional tactical situation where it's important to be quiet, but the bad guys knows you're there, right? So being really clear about your communication, like we're here, we're here, we're moving here, we're coming together, you come with me, you know, and being very clear in those communications um, is going to be better for the good guys than it is going to be tipping off the bad guy or something along those lines. I think sometimes I agree. Our officers have a tendency to, they, they think they're going to sneak up on something and that's not the case. They know you're there. You're going to move quickly. You're going to talk to each other right. and you're going to get to the threat and neutralize the threat. Um, and I think whether you're doing that on the radio or whether you're doing it face to face or across the hallway, um, is, is really important. To- this is called active shooter incident management. It, this is an active shooter. Everything's different. Mm-hmm. And this is one of those rare times where if we're getting shot at, yay, they're not shooting at innocent people. Right. And it's counterintuitive. Doesn't, doesn't take away the fact that it's accurate. Hopefully the fire is not. So but I mean, be loud and proud, be right. loud and proud, exactly. own it. Okay. This is us. We're coming in. So. As we drill down on the contact two, I want to talk a little bit about how they get formed, when they get formed, and they and they push up because we are strong advocates of if you're in the scene, you need to be there with a task and purpose. So I kind of want to go back to the history lesson of why we changed this years ago because of what we actually saw in training and exercises is that contact one would get organized. Mm -hmm. You'd have one or two that would go in immediately. The other ones would go in when they got there, but they would link up. And that that was working, as we said, working pretty efficiently. I think, Mm -hmm. Adam, you said, I think we got that one down. Yeah. That's coming together. And tactical, that fifth arriving officer, sixth arriving officer, whatever it is, was getting stood up. And that was working. The thing that we observed, though, is that there was a delay. It took a little time for whoever was in that tactical role to get situational awareness over what was going on and begin to effectively take charge. Mm -hmm. Right. And that reflex time, whether it was one minute, two minutes, three minutes, was a delay waiting for tactical to call for a second contact team when we already can pretty much take for granted you want a second contact team. Right. You know, the, the number of times where the first contact, the first, four officers dispense with the threat is a large proportion of these things. It's not typically taking 30, 40, 50 officers to neutralize the threat. Mm -hmm. That's not the typical scenario. So we wanted to get the second contact team downrange. And what we observed was just the simple reality that when you're trying to assume that tactical role, there was a little bit of a lag, a little bit of a delay in getting your feet underneath you. Meanwhile, You've got a couple of officers, two, three, four officers that have showed up. They're ready to be contact two, and they're waiting for orders. And what we've said is, okay, this doesn't make sense. We want the first four officers are going to form that first contact team. That fifth officer, sixth officer, whatever it is, is going to take the tactical job. And then the next two, three, four officers that come in behind that person are going to become contact two. Mm -hmm. Now, whether they do that at – if tactical is designated a staging location and they go there and rally up and then they get in one vehicle and move forward or whether, <clears throat> pardon me, staging, the lo- staging location hasn't been established yet and they all roll up to the front of the school, the front right. of the building, front of the church, whatever the case may be. But the point is, like Adam said, don't go in under your own call sign, 
get yourselves organized into a team. Uh, and I wanted to make sure that we addressed both the history of why we made that change. And it had to do with speed. Everything has to do with the right. clock and getting the guns down range. So we're looking for that contact one, which is in most cases going to take care of the threat. Right. And then contact two to get in right behind him. Now, the question of what contact two needs to do, I'd like to drill down a little bit more. We talked about the link up procedure, and both of you kind of indicated we need to find out from contact one what they need done. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about for a minute the different uh, scenarios that you guys gave you. So you said, one, we need more guns in the fight. Mm -hmm. Do we want to apply a little strategy? So let's talk about that one. And then we'll go back to uh, contact one has the threat either cornered or neutralized. Contact two, they want to go to where the casualties were or something like that. Sure. We'll work from there. Good enough? Yeah. Good. All right. So let's talk a little bit about, Billy, I'm going to put this one to you. Okay. You've got the second contact team moving up. Contact one is giving chase, so to speak, mm -hmm. to the threat. Uh, what does that look like when they want that second contact team as guns in the fight on the threat? How do you coordinate that on the fly? Um, go. Link up with them, find out where they are, find out where the, the person is, and then formulate a plan there. And it's going to be situationally dependent on where the bad guy is or bad girl, mm -hmm. the bad person. So have them in there and and be prepared to initiate and, and engage them. So what are the things that you would want them to be aware of, be careful of, think about when you've got two different teams that are trying to bring fire to bear on where a everyone is? Yeah. Who's with the person? Who's with the bad guy? Are there innocents in there? Are there hostages? Are you know who who's in there with them? And are there any environmental issues? Not that it would really matter in the terms of a gunfight, but it's it's good to know. Yeah. When you say environmental issues, what do you like mean? Like gas. Okay. Like IEDs, like stuff like that. But you still got to stop. Absolutely, you got to stop the behavior of Regardless, the bad guys. You got to you got to you got to engage them and cease their behavior. All right, Adam. So I was just going to say, even if let's say eight officers have made it to where the the suspect is, where the stimulus is, you still want to have two teams because you may split up at that point and say one of you go, hey, go around to the backside, go down that hallway, you hold them there. I'm gonna, we're going to go this direction. You don't want just for span of control reasons. You don't want all eight trying to come from the same direction and and trying to communicate through one leader. That's bad span of control and it's bad tactics. Um, so even if contact team two has linked up with contact team one to be more guns in the fight, you're still op operating as two separate units, units, units right? Who can, who can do good work and communicate with each other. I mean, that's really worth emphasizing at this point is, is, Again, if all eight of us are pointing our guns from one angle, we're that's not a very good strategy. I mean, of course, unless the suspect's directly right, right there in front of you. That's where they are. Well, right. Then, and you can avoid a crossfire. Right, and you can avoid a crossfire. But so. um, but still operating as a couple different teams to to do something tactically smart is is a good way to go. Okay. So now let's talk about the more common scenario where contact one has the suspect in custody or right, down, right. Uh, under control, and w they've seen some casualties that they've had to move past. We want contact two to circle back and start taking care of business there. What's the list of duties? So contact one's got the suspect. Contact two is so, – so active mm. – priority number one, active threat right. is – Arc, right. Is right. done. Threat. Mm -hmm. Now we're into the, the rescue, which has mm -hmm. got to start with – uh, getting some security stood up. What does that look like? So I think that's really important to emphasize is we train a lot to the fact that while it's still active, if you're hearing active stimulus, we train officers, you have to move past the injured and move towards that threat. But somebody has to go back and fix what you left behind. And that is a important job for contact team two or additional contact teams that are stood up is somebody has to go back and fix that area where there's casualties to establish security, immediate action plan and medical. Because that first contact team that has now engaged the suspect, they're now out of the fight. At a minimum, they're going to have to stay there and continue to secure the suspect. Um, and then later, they're going to have to go into their own officer involved right. shooting protocols and stuff. So, so that team is basically spent. Now it's going to be the job of contact team two to establish those casualty collection points, to radio into tactical what they need, that they're ready for the rescue task forces to get that next part started. The danger we see is that 
four officers have engaged a suspect. The next four come in and stand over their shoulder, and the next four come in behind them, and they're and they're all looking at the down suspect, and nobody's getting any other job done. And that that's the danger of of not keeping these roles separate. So contact to Billy. They they get back to where the injured are, mm-hmm. and they've got three or four that's in, you know in a room. They've got a couple laying down in the hallway, and of course. One of the things that we advocate for is to quickly get them consolidated down Correct. and secure what we call a casualty collection point, which is just a fancy way of saying, pick a spot, get your injured in that spot, mm. and get that spot secured. Right. Talk a little bit about why is that so important to get them out of the hallway and get them all in one spot? What what does that do from a tactical advantage to you? Um uh, from from establishing security, how does it help you to get those people pulled together instead of where they are? Well, you just like with students, when where I work now, when when we move students for a reason, where there's reunification, whatever, we want to cover them from three things. We want to cover them from the elements. We want to cover them from gunfire. We want to cover them from the media. So you want to be protected from all those. So if you're in a hallway, you're not protected, or from outside of an area for a, a down person, you're not covered from gunfire i want you covered from eyes i want you covered from everything you can be covered from it's easier to secure a door if we get them into a room let's say if adam and i get them into a room one of us can secure the door and the other one's working completely safely and so i'm a firm advocate of take a room take a room utilize that rtfs can come to you and you've got a, a default de facto CCP, an ad hoc field expedient CCP. All right. So let's talk a second. We're gonna we're gonna take a room. We've picked a room. Mm-hmm. We're dragging casualties. I, I assume you still want to advocate that somebody has got their eyes up on their weapons platform. Somebody else. Not everybody drags security. Casualties. Right. Absolutely. Somebody has security. Yeah. On the on the hallway or the exposures mm-hmm. or wherever. You get them into the room. What are the kinds of threats that you want that contact team to look for, for where to the post up? Now, you mentioned the door. That's an obvious mm-hmm. one. What if there's windows? What if there's a second door? What are the what are the factors that you guys want that contact team to think about in terms of that security posture for securing the room? I'm going to take the best room that I'm, I'm going to take a bunch of rooms before I choose a room to put the kit, the people in. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick the best room. I'm not going to just ad hoc take the first one that I get. I'm going to take one with minimal window exposure with the easiest to secure. And then I'm once I take that room, I'm going to set up SIM again. I'm going to have security on it. I'm going to have an immediate action plan. If it breaks loose, if this is a CCA, then I'm going to have another group that's going to go and somebody else is going to stay. But we're going to be calling for RTFs to come in and take over where we are in, in our CCP there. Yeah, and you're just you know you're you're checking for everything in that room quickly. Of course, whatever room you pick mm-hmm. that's going to make the most sense, a quick sweep of the room itself to make sure that there's no threats in in the room currently. Keep security on the door, and then uh, even among your your injured and your uninjured that you're potentially pulling into that room, you're keeping an eye on them as well, right? You you know we it doesn't happen very often, but it is possible that a that a potential bad actor or suspect could be mixed in with um, with those that you're trying to help. So you have to uh, be aware of that as well. So there's a lot of work for the for the second contact team to do besides those initial tactical functions. Once that active threat has been dealt with, the role of those additional contact teams can be to to do all of these things that we're talking about. So the from the security perspective, you want contact to to not only secure the external part of the room, but also somebody's got to have eyes on the inside of the room. Sure. Is that accurate? Yeah, well, someone's going to be working. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. And then, so that brings At us to the next thing. One. Is, yeah, is the, is the medical piece. Once we've mm-hmm. got the security established, we've got an agreed-upon plan. If there's more shots fired, who's staying, who's going, it's time to go to work on the, on the medical side. Sure. And one of the things that we certainly advocate for is the prioritization. Mm-hmm. And in the fire and EMS service, we use triage to kind of sort the severity levels of, of folks. And there is some uh, protocols that we follow on how we group those. But for law enforcement, we're wanting to keep it very simple. And and the way we we suggest that is for law enforcement, if they're injured, and that's key, if they're injured and they're a walking wounded, that's a green. 
Anything else that's injured and red. isn't walking is a red. Mm -hmm. That's it. It's yeah. it's that simple. Um, and those numbers are important to pass outside, to pass mm -hmm. upstream. To your RTF. Pass it to the RTFs, which you're going to pass it to tactical. The tag, and he's going to pass it And he's going to pass it on to triage and to the All RTFs. Right. So then the next step in that is to geographically triage that room, separate the room. So you pick, I presume, a wall to put your uninjured against right. a wall. Right. Then for the walking wounded, the walking injured, the greens, you put them in a separate spot, which then leaves only the reds laying on the floor in the room, mm -hmm. which is becomes your priority for beginning medical treatment. Have I... Express that right. Did yes, I miss sure. Anything? Absolutely. Um, the, the you're kind of sorting the room um, to to do all of those functions that you just talked about, and then it allows you to focus clearly on that priority of those that are down and can't move. Those are the ones that are going to need the most immediate attention. So, um, your you know tourniquets and direct pressure and uh, wound packing and those kind of things that you're able to do, especially either if you carry the equipment on yourself or there's uh, maybe a, a kit in the room that you can use. Um, and depending on the number of injured, you know, obviously on the one hand we want to reduce the trauma of those uninjured survivors. However, you may need to enlist their help. You know, you you may need to bring them over and have them help keep direct pressure on some of the correct wounded. yeah you may want to have them apply that pressure and i want to stress that this is after everything is controlled right this is after yeah. well you got yeah. security on it right yeah. no i mean after like contact one has taken the bag high yes out this is this one this is or you have absolutely no stimulus no right? stimulus right, right. because right. um you know and we have seen the they numbers fled. increase right where the, the you know the, the suspect has left before right. law enforcement arrives so which sometimes the shooting stops and we don't know why right. which is exactly. a win right sure it's take the win and count it win. and move on well it's a win if we react properly um, well good point. that's a whole we've had that discussion before sure. is that we if we spend too much time chasing ghosts then right. you know then people are laying injured and you know, so. Absolutely. So we get the room uh, triaged. We get it sorted physically. So we've mm -hmm. got the uninjured, we've got the walking wounded, and we've got the reds. We've got security on it. Now comes the task of communicating all of that to tactical. This is where we are. We have a CCP established, three reds, security established, five greens, five uninjured. Mm -hmm. we need however many RTFs you think we need, whatever. Right. And I think it's worth emphasizing at this point that this is one of those circumstances where it's okay to delegate up. The contact teams are the eyes and ears inside the crisis site. And it is okay for contact team two to tell tactical, I need, we're going to need at least two RTFs here. I need a third contact team to go clear a uh, hallway. A, we haven't been down there yet, whatever the case may be. Right? right. So it's, it, and I think that's really important. We, we have tactical in a leadership role, but they don't have the eyes and ears inside the contact team, especially that second contact team too. That's not necessarily. You should have your feet under you. Yeah, more. exactly. They mm -hmm. should be able to, to be able to calmly. Right reason communicate through. what they're seeing and what they're doing and what is needed in a lot of ways what you're describing is what we often in the fire service call can report conditions action needs mm -hmm. contact tactical from contact two. we have a ccp established in room 18 i got three reds five greens five uninjured right. whatever those numbers are i need at least two rtfs i need another contact team to exist to to assist with this thing, whatever that thing right. may be. Fair? Right. Well, well and, and I'll ask, do you even need to tell them you need two RTFs? You've just given them, I'm, and I'm asking, you've mm. given them what you, oh, you've, sure. you've given them the right number, just whatever you yeah. you and triage want to send. <laughs> yeah, I think that that's, that's a really, really good question. And Does what I would mean, say you know is, I mean? if you're able to say, I've got three reds and five, five greens, greens. That's, that is so extraordinarily helpful to fire right, EMS. Right. Because if you reverse that and you tell me you've got five reds and three greens, I'm not thinking two RTFs. I'm thinking three RTFs. Or right. four. Or, or maybe even four before right. we're done. Maybe I need a fourth RTF that's right. just going to do the shuttle. The, the, the thing I think would give discretion is not all reds are created equal. No. Maybe they're a red because they got shot in the leg and they can't walk. Um, and it's bleeding, but it's not bleeding that bad. That's a whole lot different 
than sucking chest wing. Right. They got two rounds to the chest. They got right. a round to the belly. They've got mm-hmm. two or three rounds to the back. Right. Or I've got my three reds are all three thoracic injuries. Correct. Right? They're all truncal gunshots. Right. Those are all three critical patients. And so you, if you have a sense of that as a law enforcement officer, I don't think it hurts to say to tactical, I think we're going to need two RTFs, three RTFs, whatever. Mm-hmm. Right. But you don't have to. Right. right. If you give us the reds and the greens, we're way ahead of the game. And quite yeah. frankly, if you just tell me you got eight injured, we're right. still ahead, we're of, the still ahead of the game. We're yeah. still ahead of the game. And and we'll right size it from there. Because here's what's going to happen is that first RTF that gets in there is going to quickly look the room over right. and call back to triage and go, yeah, I'm going to need four more RTFs. Right. I'm going to need a little help. Right. I need right. I need some brothers and sisters in here to help. Mm-hmm. So um, – I think one of the things that I want to make sure is crystal clear for the audience, though, because I I do think that this role most commonly falls to contact two. The clock is ticking. Bang, yes. bang. The yeah. clock is ticking. And as as Pete says, what's your threat right now? Is it a bad guy? Is it a gun? Or is it a clock? Well, contact one's dealt with the guy. So it's no longer the gun. It's the clock. The faster you get RTFs in there, the faster these people get in front of a surgeon, the more lives we can save. The RTFs are not coming until tactical hears that you've got security established. Correct. Now, maybe you don't have a CCP, and that's okay. We want you to, but, you know, if you don't, you don't. Right. But you've secured an area that's good enough for the RTFs to get moving. Mm -hmm. Tactical's got to hear that. Because if you're not talking to them and tell them you've established right. a security posture and this is the location you want the RTFs to come to, right? They're not coming, right? Um, and I think again, the the reason that role was so important as a, a second and even additional contact teams is that we sometimes see that everyone wants to go right back to contact team one for all information. They think they're they think they're doing all the jobs, and sometimes even our first contact team officers think that they have to do all the jobs. It's like they forget that it's okay that a second contact team will come in and do some of those other tasks that need to get done. And you can stay focused on the area that you have secured. You have secured an area that has the suspect in it. You have your own immediate action plan. Um, You're probably providing medical care to somebody there and possibly even including the suspect. That second contact team is going to fix all the other stuff that needs to get done. Right. Good point. So let me spin the scenario a little bit. Uh, you contact one gives uh, neutralizes the threat in the same room where the injured are. Mm-hmm. So it's a like a cafeteria or you know large conference room, meeting room, training room, something like that. But you've got injured because the bad guy was in there doing the shooting, and contact one comes in and services the bad guy. Bad guy's down in the corner. So now contact one is holding security on the bad guy. You've still got a mess of a room. How does contact two's role change or does it? It depends. It depends on how many injured there are. If there's not many injured, I personally would move them because they've already been traumatized enough. I'm going to get them away from Doofus McDooferson, who we've eradicated his behavior. I'm going to move them away from him or her. And put them somewhere else. If it's not, I'm going to barricade that because it is a crime scene and I'm going to keep from contaminating it as much as possible. But depending on how many people there are, Mm -hmm. it's going to depend on what I do. It would be nice not to have the suspect in the cash collection point with the Uh, injured they just attacked. If if possible. I mean, we don't take a Hippocratic oath, but we should and we kind of do. And I don't want to do more harm. Right. And, and so I want, I'm, I'm a huge advocate, just like, I don't, I don't, I'm not an advocate of treating innocents like garbage. I don't have to put a muzzle on their face. They've already had a pretty terrible day without me sticking a muzzle on their face, screaming to get on the effing ground or whatever. I don't have to do that, you know? And, right. uh, and, uh, I'm worried about the, the probabilities, not the possibilities. And so, and as, as much as I can guard them, cause I, you know, our, our saying that I always said when we were teaching was. You've had a horrible day, and I'm sorry for that. I'm going to try to make it better from here on out, and mm-hmm. or, and that's what I'm going to do. Right. And if I can take an adjacent room or an adjacent 
area, I'm going to do that and move them over there. Yeah. At the very least, move the uninjured if you can. Absolutely. Yeah. Assuming you've got enough hands on deck to get security. Which you them. can. Okay. Which brings us back. Like, even if contact one and two end up in the same room, they still have different jobs to do, right? Correct. Um, it's all the same mission, but they're probably going to have different jobs to do. And they need to remember that there's different jobs to get done. Um, not just over convergence in general, but I can't emphasize enough how frequently – too many officers focus on one task and and just by splitting them into teams it gives them the idea that hey this team's doing one thing our team needs to do something else like billy said i we got to find work to do and what he means by that is let's not all work on this same problem right. there's more problems to be Doofus solved mcdooferson yes right, right. Um, McDooferson. and um, and and just the simple act of designating a second contact team or a third contact team, and so on, by designating them as a separate team and giving them a se uh, separate task and purpose, you start to divide up all these tasks that need to get done. The division of labor is yes. more organic. Yeah. And I think that that is a really, really good point because you just mentioned you know, getting another contact team, contact three, contact four, whatever. And that one of the things that, that I've observed, I think, is you alluded to it earlier, they feel like they've got to do everything. Mm -hmm. We don't. You know, contact one's got Doofus McDooferson. Contact two is dealing with the CCP and the injured, which may or may not be in the same Correct. Uh, location. We're, we need to get an ambulance exchange point secured. That should be a different contact team that takes mm -hmm. care of that. Right. And then if you need a cordon secured between where your that's CCP is, one. that's another contact team. Right. Because by the time this unfolds, you're going to have friends that have shown up. Mm -hmm. yes. I, I know there are so many places where we've talked to and they're like, well, we just don't have those resources. I understand that you don't have those resources in your organization on but duty. Everybody doesn't have the same uniform. And they are going to show up. They are 100% going to show are up. They are going to show up from constables to feds. The to agricultural the, police. To, to the, the postal the, police. Of course. They are going to show up. You're yeah. going to have help. So don't try to do everything yourself. Now, it's if tactical calls back and says, I don't have anybody to send to that. Can you figure it out? Mm -hmm. That's a different story. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Then you make Correct. do. Yeah. You know, you, you got eggs, you make omelets. But I think that that's an important thing to say as well is don't, don't let your mission creep overload your ability to execute well. Right. So when another contact team is assigned and they come into the, your crisis site and they say, how can we help? You should have a job for them. The moment you run out of jobs is the time that you tell tactical, we don't need any more officers downrange. Right. Um, you know, if and it's as simple as that. Um, and using, again, I, it's just a division of labor. It is splitting mm -hmm. up the task. Um, you know, there should not be more than, um, you know, two to four or five at the most on a contact team because that's a good span of control. It's something one person can be on the radio for directing that team um, and giving them, you know, following whatever they were assigned to do. If you start getting more than that, split them up into another team and, and find another job to get done. Right. All right. Final thoughts on this one, Billy, what's your, your, your overarching thought here on contact to and the focus. Remember what your primary mission is, and that's to save lives. If Doofus McDooferson has already been handled, move forward, looking for work, being cognizant of what the division of labor is and what the priority of, work is and implement that active threat rescue clear arc and and again using naming these teams by number and splitting up the jobs is is a way to remind yourself that there's more than one job that needs to get done and i think for mine i would say look we have a process we've laid out in the asm checklist first four go in they make contact one fifth officer becomes tactical six seven eight nine become contact two and they move in and we train to that. But the reality is probably going to be a little different on your game day. You're going to have three, four, five officers going to go down range, be part of contact one. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to end up with a, with a mini polyester dog pile in the parking lot mm -hmm. of three, four, five officers that are arrived very quickly that are all kind of um, not stalling out a little bit, but like, okay, what do we do? What's next? Right. Somebody takes tactical, you assign the rest of the guys to be contact to, and you send them to go do the job. It right. doesn't matter whether it goes by the numbers 
or it comes in a little sideways, you know, a landing's a landing. Right. As long as the wheels are down, it doesn't really matter if you come in skidding a little bit sideways, get her done and address the issue. But we need contact right. two to back up contact one as fast as possible. Yep. I like it. All right. Gentlemen, thank you very much. This was a, this was an exciting topic, really kind of back at the very first part of the ASM checklist process. <laughs> it's uh, it's excited to get to. Yeah. Uh, thanks for coming in. Good conversation. Thank you to our producer, Carla Torres, for making us always look great. If you have not liked and subscribed to the podcast, please do so and share it with the folks that you work with. Uh, we all have to get on the same page. If we have one of these bad days, we are not going to solve the problem by ourselves. Your friends are coming. Get them all on the same page. And until next time, stay safe.